Before we start today, first and foremost, welcome to the podcast. My name is Kyle Willard. As always, I am your host. This is going to be a fun one. This is the first time that we have a guest on the podcast. I want to make a very special thank you to my dad, Scott Willard, for joining us. We're going to talk about leadership skills. We're going to talk about you know things to focus on as an entry level employee. You know, kind of what executive leadership is. We're going to go through a bunch of stuff, so hang on. Let's dive straight in. We're ready. All right, so joining us on the podcast today, we have leadership trainer and looks like program director for an organization out in Kitsap County, um, Scott Willard. As, as a side note. I did indeed bring my dad into the podcast, so we're going to do that. <laughs> um, I thought that it was important to talk about leadership. I thought that it was important to kind of highlight the work that's being done out in Kitsap County. And, you know, generally it, it kind of breaks up the monotony because let's let's be real. We, we push really hard with diving into the, the harder skills of software engineering but sometimes we need to talk about soft skills soft skills are just as important and sometimes they're more important to keep an organization organization in check so thank you for joining me dan um you know welcome to the circus yeah thanks kyle i appreciate uh the opportunity to be here you know for uh for context so kitsap county is from port orchard washington through Bremerton, Silverdale, uh, Polesbell, and Kingston, and uh, Bainbridge Island. And so for those of you that may not know uh, the Seattle area very well, uh, it's, it's basically a 30 minute ferry ride from Bremerton to the heart of Seattle. And so I, I am smack dab in uh, the, the residential uh, portion of what is identified as the greater Seattle area. Now, just, just out of curiosity, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty obvious. There's, there's a lot of software engineers out there. Have you encountered any as you're, you're doing your work as far as the homelessness side of things? So we, so not... Uh, well, I take that back. So we have one resident that's uh, working on an associate's degree uh, in computer sciences. Uh, otherwise, the, the folks that I've met uh, in the uh, uh, IT arena have all been uh, related to uh, either a motorcycle club that I belong to or uh, to uh, friends at church or neighbors, but not, not in conjunction with our housing program. We've had a couple of organizations that are kind of cool, uh, retired folks from Microsoft that have stepped forward and offered to assist us with uh, refurbishing and giving us computers. So that's been kind of cool, but other than that, no. So what, you know, obvi obviously we, you know, spent a little bit of time, put together some questions. So let's, let's kind of go through some of those. What, what is your current title and actually a, a more detailed job description about what you do? Well, so my day job, I work as the program director for an organization uh, called Kitsap Homes of Compassion. We're a nonprofit 
that creates shared housing opportunities for disabled homeless. And right now uh, we have 25 homes and about 110 residents. And so what I do on any given day is I manage the group of about 13 volunteers that act as house managers for those homes. And I manage a team of four uh, social work oriented case managers that provide direct service in those homes. And I, I really, I manage and oversee the operations for the organization. So that's my day job. And then I have a private practice where I do executive coaching, training, and uh, some organizational development work. And that's my private practice. And I've got a few clients that I work with uh, and uh, feel really, really good about that work as well. But uh, they, they don't tend to cross over that much. Fair enough. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, executive or just executive leadership or just, you know, management as a general, what, what does that mean? I mean, what, what does that actually entail? Because it's such, it, it seems like, ex especially for a lot of those folks who haven't been in more corporate environments, you, you hear executive leadership, you hear, you know, executive management, you hear leadership as a general, and you think, you know, just basically a babysitter who gets to, you know, drive the car, right? where, you know, you, you have this mindset where it's just, you know, these are the people that are making the decisions that directly affect how much I'm making, you know, is, is there more to that? And, and kind of, can we pull back the curtain a little bit and, you know, understand what leadership is? Wow. You know, <laughs> uh, so you did, you did provide me these questions in advance and I, I even wrote some responses to them in advance. But, you know, as you ask this question, uh, it right now, my initial response is a little different than what I wrote to you earlier. And I, you know, what, what executive leadership means to me is that I hold a lot of stress and I, I take it very personally, uh, that I am, I am the upline for, for staff. And when I write a budget, when I approve expenditures, when I write a contract, when I write for grants, I take it very personally that there are those four staff whose livelihoods are dependent on me doing my job right. And if I blow it, I'm probably still going to be employed, but if I blow it, I'm gonna to have to be saying goodbye to them. So I, I, I sit with that weight on my shoulders a lot. And I think that that's a trait that is common with good leaders. There are leaders out there that, that really take it for granted and have a very cavalier attitude about the decisions they make and the work they do, but I, I don't. Executive leadership to me is more than just being a leader. It is truly taking on the responsibility for the organization that I work for and for the staff that work directly under me and for those who I would identify as our customers. So it, it's a big deal. I, you know, th there's been lots of, uh, lots of social science research on the question of are leaders born or are they made? And the answer to that is most definitely yes. <laughs> They're both. <laughs> there are good leaders that for one reason or another, the way that they're raised, their intrinsic, uh, thinking process, 
and personalities lend themselves very, very well to the, the duties of leadership. At the same time, every time you're walking through your office and there's a task that falls, falls from someone's hands and you pick it up, you in essence are stepping into a leadership role. You are stepping up to do what others are not doing and you are taking leadership, you're taking initiative. And when you take initiative, you are leading. And at some point you look behind you, there are people following. The, the challenge is that those same people that are following you are also talking amongst themselves about how they could do it better. And it is a relatively thankless role to be a leader. If anyone wakes up and they desire to be a leader, they should go back to sleep. <laughs> go back that, to bed. That rough, don't, huh? Don't, don't wake up. Well, <laughs> if, I mean, if you take the role as seriously as I do, it, it is rough. It, it is serious. It's, it's not a play thing. The responsibilities I have, uh, I, I do not take them lightly. And uh, yes, I... I'm paid well, I am uh, I'm well taken care of. Whether or not those things at the end of the day are truly uh, equal in relationship to the, the emotional <clears throat> and spiritual energy that I put into the work I do, I would say, I would tend to say no. And, you know, you already uh, owned the fact that um, that I'm your dad, and so I'll I'll go there real quick and say, I mean, uh -oh. you grew up with it. You you from the family's perspective, you know how much it took out of me to do what I do, right. and to the degree that I escaped, uh, you know, when I got home. Uh, either through you know positive behaviors or negative behaviors to the degree that I had to go escape and uh, recharge that had an impact on you and that has an impact on the home life and so it's it's uh, it's difficult right no I I think that's a fair statement you know I I think you know, you, you make a really good point as far as, you know, everything, you know, there, there's the conversation that everything rolls downhill, but I, I think to be fair, you know, there's, there's a good chunk of that, that lands at the top and it just doesn't move. You know, it's, it's <laughs> what, it's what the yeah. person at the top shovels back down that actually, you know, rolls downhill, but there's, there's a lot that doesn't, you know, it, when it, to, to be fair, somebody in a leadership role, they're, they're dealing with the day-to-day -day planning. They're dealing with coordination of, you know, however many projects they're making sure that all of the metrics are being hit. You're making sure that all of your, you know, licensures, you know, your grants, all of that is dealt with, whether it's by you or a, a subordinate. But I mean, at the end of the day, that, that all starts from the top. So let's, let's shift gears, right? Um, you know, if, if you had one skill that you could teach somebody that is either, you know, just getting into the workplace for the first time or, or somebody who feels like they're stuck at the bottom rung, you know, an entry level employee, somebody, somebody who's fighting to dive into a new industry, somebody who's, you know, in an industry already and just finding it tough. What are the skills that you would, you know, what, what are the skills that you would train them with? Well, those are two different things. The, the skills that I would suggest that you need to perfect uh, are different than the skills that I would train you on because the skills that I would suggest you need to perfect are intrinsic and they're character-based. And it's very difficult to train skills that are character-based. But the, the number one skill that I would say that, that uh, I would recommend that you develop would be that you show up. And when I say show up, I mean mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, you show up. 
every day you are there, you are looking for uh, how to do the best job you can, and you take initiative. And uh, when it comes to working with your peers and coworkers, that you exercise uh, emotional intelligence and good communication skills. And that is tough. I, that is very tough. Right. I mean, you know, as, as somebody who's been in sales, somebody who's been, you know, both at the bottom rung of the rung of the rat, the ladder, dear God, I can't even speak English today. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who's been at the bottom, been in the middle in a degree um, and, you know, basically been at the, been at the top for a market, you know, I, I tend to agree with that. You know, I, I think that the biggest thing you run into, and I, I think this is, this is honestly a really big trait that there's a lot more people in sales that struggle with in a lot of different industries is that, you know, salespeople, you know, we have to exude a sense of confidence. We have to know what we're talking about. Even if we don't know what we're talking about, we have to act as though we do. We should, <laughs> but, you know, even if we don't, we have to act like we do. And, and the problem is, is that there, that pattern of behavior tends to lend itself to being a bit more greedy, self-absorbed, a little bit more narcissistic in times. And, you know, it, it's, it's more common that salespeople will burn out over personal issues and, you know, they'll implode in a sales setting specifically because they can't leave their baggage at the door when they walk through the door. You know, they're, you're there 60 hours, 70 hours a week. And, you know, your home life and your work life basically become so intertwined because you're constantly picking up the phone and doing the job. You can't disconnect. So I, I yeah. definitely hear that. So the, the skill that I, would, that I would coach you on if you were my employee that I think would be the most valuable, uh, there, there are two of them. The first is very simple, and that is be timely. Show up on time. When you say you're going to do something, do it on time or let me know if you're not. And then the second skill that I would coach you on would be to maintain a, a, a presence of curiosity. You're always wondering, wondering uh, whether you can do what you do better, wondering if there are better ways to do what we do, uh, wondering how you're coming across to those that you are uh, serving uh, as your customer. Are there better ways to, uh, to interact with your coworkers for the team to be more efficient and successful? So curiosity, really approaching uh, your daily work with that sense of curiosity. Those are, the, those are a couple of things that I think are, are vital skills that can be coached. So, I mean, let's, let's take a step back for a minute. I mean, obviously this podcast, you know, in its, its entirety, the inception was to, you know, help people enter the industry of software engineering, help those that are just entering kind of get some of the soft skills that would better, you know, propel them forward. And, and for even veteran software engineers to kind of get a bit better grasp on soft skills. You know, there's, there's the common misconception that most of most software engineers, you know, are, are basically completely introverted and they can't talk to people. And so one of the focuses is to kind of hit the soft skills really, really hard as we start. And then we're going to, you know, pivot more towards the technical side, which is why we're doing this so early. You know, what advice would you give towards an entry level or, you know, an, somebody trying to get in, you know, what, what advice would you give them to try and work towards being promoted to a more senior level as they get into the industry? Well, I think everything that I've said so far fits that. So show up, take initiative, be curious, be timely. The other thing that I would say is, uh, especially when you think about your role in technology, is to look at the world through the lens of systems. Mm -hmm. 
you're you are not isolated you are a you are a part of a whole and to know who the other parts are and how and where and when those parts come together uh, to complete the whole i think is is key and i think one of the things that separates uh it folks from those that grow and succeed is that many IT folks see their job, see their work as a piece, period. They, they never really look for how it interconnects and uh, try to envision what the whole will look like. They simply put their nose down and they get after it. They chase the code for a particular purpose, not really asking the question of how does this all come together? What's what's the what's the product of all of these divergent uh pieces and so seeing it from a systems perspective and and looking at the big picture so that you can find ways to show up and be creative and innovate i think is is what uh separates those from being very happy at entry level to those that, that want to and actually do succeed in moving forward. I do, you know, I do want to take a minute. You you wrote about a paragraph on this and I honestly, like I read it earlier <laughs> and I actually really, really <laughs> liked what was being said. So I'm, I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to read this because I think that this is important. I think that, you know, what you wrote originally versus, you know, all of it's good, right? But I really like the way that this was said. So what what was originally put forward was this. Listen, really listen. And if you have questions, ask. Yeah. Don't assume you know what someone is asking for. Secondly, I think you need to think systematically, which we covered. Everyone and everything connects. You can't exist as in a tiny insular bubble. That little bubble is one component of a massive batch of bubbles that make the phone. Think a bubble bath and you're a one tiny component. Just like that, you do your best to work when you find ways to connect and be part of the system. Third, move forward. Always move forward with your strengths. Look for fixes to weaknesses, but don't get stuck in them. Your power and your energy are in forward momentum. So learn to fail quickly yep. and get over it. I think that that's really impactful. You know, we, in, in software engineering, there's a 20 minute rule. If you get stuck for 20 minutes, you're supposed to fire off you know, a Slack message or an email, touch base with your team, see if you can get somebody to follow up with you to kind of, you know, get you out of that hole and then keep going. And I, I think that, you know, almost living that lifestyle of, you know, if you get stuck, ask, you know, ask, ask for somebody to take a minute and have a conversation with you, even, even if it's stupid, you know, if, if you get in, if you spin into a rage and you can't step back, the only thing you're going to do is make things worse. So let's let's talk about more fun stuff, right? We've we've talked about kind of the nitty gritty about what you need to be as a leader, you know, what you need to be as, you know, an entry level person. So let's ask this: What was the one most impactful moment that changed your life? Mm. And specifically tied into work. <laughs> we're we're gonna dodge yeah, the obvious I, that you had kids <laughs> yeah yeah well i you know i have always i've been one of those folks that no matter what job i've taken i have quickly moved into a management role and uh uh i would say that that the most impactful uh Thing that has happened to change my career was a staff mutiny. I, uh, at around 30, uh, I had been incredibly successful building programs. Uh, and I, by programs, I'm not talking about computer programs. I'm talking about social service programs. Right. And uh, had taken a little itty bitty nonprofit from about 60,000 a year to uh, 600,000 
within three years, which is pretty phenomenal growth. And that got me the attention of uh, a local county uh, department director and he recruited me. And uh, what he said to me was, I, I see clearly how good you are at designing and developing social service programs. I would like you to do that for the county. But here's the challenge. I need you to be able to live with it once you do it. And I thought that was a weird request at the time. Uh, but he had, he had like three particular metrics that he challenged me with. And I took to each of those metrics and I made it happen. And as I'm saying this, I'm paying attention to the number of times I say the word I. I made it happen. I took a team of uh, managers that all of them had about uh, 15 to 20 years of experience on me, uh, as well as age. Uh, I was at the time a bachelor's level uh, director and they were all graduate levels, some of them uh, professionally credentialed and licensed. And I rocked their world and I accomplished every one of the three metrics that I was challenged to meet. And in the meantime, I alienated every single manager that worked for me. And uh, it led ultimately to uh, a, a union complaint. And uh, I, I had options, right? I, I could have quit. I could have walked away with a severance package. Uh, I could have stayed and tucked my tail between my legs, or I could have figured out how to grow from the experience and that's what I chose to do. I, uh, uh, within two weeks of that experience and the, uh, the suit being investigated and settled, I had enrolled in a, in a graduate program uh, in uh, organizational development and systems renewal uh, that really was, was significantly focused on leadership and that was my goal. I, my goal was, heck, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this to people anymore. <laughs> you know, you heard me talk earlier about all of that weight that I carry on my shoulders as an executive leader. And uh, I carried that weight then, but I wasn't cognizant of the impact that my leadership truly had on my staff. Uh, and so I, I went to grad school to learn how to lead with soul. That was, that, that sounds corny, but those words were on my application to Seattle university. Wow. And, uh, uh, that's, that changed my life. I, I have done things differently ever since that moment. So and me... I feel proud of the, of the work that I've done since that moment. So I got a couple more for you and then we'll finish up since I know that your time is limited. Um, you know, one of, and this was, this is actually one off the top of my head. So good luck with it. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned from, from managing and wireless sales was the concept to always build your team in such a way that there was somebody to replace the person directly below you. And there was always somebody to replace the person that was below them. Because at the end of the day, you know, the, the first tier, the entry level guys, they're easy to replace, right? As, as harsh and as cynical as that sounds, I can get a thousand entry level workers, but when it comes to my, you know, initial management and replacing myself as, you know, a store manager, it was much more difficult. What what are the, you know, we, we touched on this just, just briefly, but what do you think is the importance in training those below you with the skills that you have to have to do your day-to-day -day job? And it's it kind of a, a, you know, offshoot of that. 
if you do you keep the people below you if you can't find somebody that you want to put in that position or do you hire externally mm. that's that's a really interesting question so let's go back to that whole concept of systems thinking all right so when you ask about uh training and uh preparation for all levels of staff i i would say that it goes beyond that and it, it even goes to training your customers training them on uh on expectations mm -hmm. training them on the best way to get their needs met by us uh right. and then when it comes to you know, you, you talk about the lower levels of entry and how easy it is to simply replace people. That's a place where I think that my leadership took exception to a lot of leaders. My support staff, the people that answered my own, the people that managed my calendars, the people that literally turned the lights on, turned the coffee maker on, and the people that turned the lights off and cleaned the buildings. I made sure that those people were treated with respect and dignity and that they were paid a living wage. And when it came time to having uh, meetings, I always made sure that there was a representative from my support team that sat in those meetings and have and highly believe that, that all levels of the organization need to be involved uh, in decision making for the organization. Beyond that, I I am a believer in what I would call generative leadership, and that is really that leaders are born every day. And my job as a leader is to be keeping my eyes and ears open for potential. And uh, as I see potential for uh, expanded leadership, I'm consistently working to create opportunities for that person to step up and take initiative and to grow. Right. Uh, it, you know, the, the issue of cross training is just a given for, for where I come from. Uh, it has to be done. The, the question you asked about uh, training versus hiring from outside, if you're not getting the, the level of, uh, uh, productivity or skill or service out of staff. Uh, I, I have spent the majority of my career in executive leadership working in rural communities. Mm -hmm. And I have had little choice but to take the, the most basic attributes that I felt like we needed and to help individuals grow into the, the staff person and leaders that I needed them to be. Um, on the occasions that I have hired from outside to fill leadership positions, quite frankly, they have almost always let me down. Right. And they've let me down because they don't really get the culture of the community that is within the organization. They don't really get the culture of the community that represents our customers. They, they come with a lot of amazing skill and they come with uh, a lot of talent and experience, but the only ones that I have hired from outside that succeeded were those that immediately embraced the community that, that they were serving and immersed themselves in that community. So they really got to know who they were working with uh, when it came to customers as well as staff that they were working alongside of. They put and, in the commitment. Well, it, yeah, uh, they put in the commitment and they made the investment. They really put put roots down, uh, and they they owned that role in that community. 
Uh, oftentimes you hire out, you hire to hire guns to come in to do a particular role. And 60% of the time on the job, they're spending looking for their next opportunity. Right. And I need, I need 80% of their time to be focused on making this opportunity their lives and, and really owning it. So I, I will say this. I mean, I, I think, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm fairly cynical about that. And I think a lot of that comes from so many years working in sales roles. Um, you know, I've, I've been in positions where I've, I've been the second wave of flooding a car dealership's floor. I've been in a situation where, you know, I've, I've been told, Hey, you, you don't hit your metrics, you know, two months in a row, you're gone. You know, it's, it's very, it's very, very cutthroat. Now, you know, I, I will say my time as, you know, a market manager for a company doing exactly that, doing wireless sales, you know, they prescribed to that mindset where you, you basically, you, you hire, you vet, you know, you make sure that you get the best people for the job. You've got a limited number of people who are going to apply for these positions because of certain aspects of it. And you basically, you know, regardless of what they do, you just keep training. And I, I think that they went to a drastic level when they did that. You know, I, I had a salesperson in the, in the total of a month, he would sell, you know, four devices. 31 days in the month, he would sell four, you know, which, you know, when I was a, a salesperson, I was, I was putting out, you know, closer to 50 a month. So it's, it's one of those where, you know, my role was to train, was to educate to, you know, but the problem is, is that my superior wouldn't let me, you know, start disciplining people for not hitting metrics. You know, the metrics weren't how you got fired in this company. I, I had, an employee that quite literally, you know, said inappropriate things to a customer. I had another one blow up on the, you know, the primary business that we were housed within. You know, I, I saw really, really drastic things happen and these people stayed. You know, I had one that, you know, screamed at me and called me racial slurs in the back, in the back room. So to me, like, I understand the mindset of it. And I definitely, you know, am a big fan of loyalty and promoting within because I think that that's a much more healthy way to grow. But I, I think that to a degree, there has to be a balance because you can't, you can't continually give somebody chances if they're not producing and if they're not actually giving viable benefit to the team. Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge to find um because first of all i i two thoughts about that one is that you have to hold people accountable mm -hmm. second of all my my uh work in training uh people internally that that wasn't that wasn't altruistic uh that that was that was math, right. you know, and I think that every company has got to do the math to determine where that, that sweet spot is because I had to factor, you know, what the cost of uh, settling with that employee was if they exited. I had to factor in the cost of loss of productivity mm -hmm. uh, while that person was gone. I had to factor in the cost of recruiting interviewing training and the loss of productivity while they were training and quite frankly each position was basically counted as a loss for close to a year right and so you, you've got to do the math on the sweet spot um some some positions in some businesses you know quite frankly you you could cope with four sales versus 50 for quite a while before you met that, that threshold. Right. Uh, Cause at the very least, it was nice to have a body on the floor and they, they had 
hopefully, <laughs> you know, hopefully they had some attributes that were value add, even though their sales weren't. And to what degree do you give up those value adds uh, when you cut them loose? And, and so you, you've got to do the math. Right. And for me, for me, uh, you know, again, I was in a rural setting and it was incredibly expensive to recruit and the loss of revenue while we were, uh, you know, spending the time to recruit and hire and train was so dramatic that it was just more cost effective to train internally. Right. No, and, and we, we definitely did that. And, you know, the, the individual I'm talking about, just to be clear, you know, he couldn't hit his numbers to save his life. You know, there, there was a big piece of that where, you know, most, most sales jobs, you're mainly being paid on commission. Even, even wireless sales, usually you get minimum wage. And then from there, you're going to get a, you know, percentage after the fact. Right. This, this organization paid above minimum wage. And the actual commission side of it was substantially lower than you would expect in the industry. So for him, you know, it, it, he did a lot and he actually, you know, his, his best skill and why it was so frustrating to me was the fact that he was amazing with people. He could get in, he could, he could get the most stoic person to talk and to laugh. And that was, that was my biggest frustration because he had so much potential and I just couldn't get him energized to move in the right direction. Um, you know what though, I'm, I'm looking at the time here and I've got to, you know, as, as much as I want to, you know, go for another three hours since, you know, this is leadership and hiring and, you know, best practices and stuff like that. There's, there's so much there to explore. And I think, you know, if, if you're willing to do it down the road, you know, maybe, maybe a follow-up would be fun to do and just kind of go over, you know, some of those topics. Um, I, I will touch base with you after the show, get some links added, you know, if, if you want to plug the, um, website, feel free to do so. You know, I, I definitely, I think that Kips up home of Com homes of compassion. I think that the work that you guys are doing is tremendous. The idea of, you know, establishing more permanent housing, for those that are in need of a home is, is definitely a huge, huge thing. And I, I, you know, that was part of the reason I wanted you on the podcast was to give that some more exposure. It's, it's something that I, I definitely support from my end. So, so thank you for that work, you know, drop any links you would like and I'll, I'll say goodbye. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to be on the show. This of is course. fun. Thanks. Anytime. <laughs> All right. Bye.